So welcome everyone. The way I have um, thought about doing this lecture is essentially to expose all of you to research. This is an advanced seminar. Uh, so important to note that we are not, this is not a traditional classroom lecture. And um, in general, my objective is to either introduce to the research or if you already research, to help you think about becoming an independent researcher. So um, uh, at least for my PhD student, one of the goal for a PhD is uh, to become independent researcher. And uh, that's a lot different than somebody telling you work on this, get these results, write this up, publish. Okay. So, um, and this thing I'm talking about is valuable to those who are not PhD students also in that, that they can get a sense of what it is to become independent researcher. Some of you are, many of you in graduate studies uh, may be thinking whether a research career is for you or it is not. The other objective, so that is one objective. The second objective and probably equally important is to expose you to some of the um, uh, important things that are happening in computer science broadly uh, and um, given that uh, I direct the Artificial Intelligence Institute and we are, you know, there's a lot of work in AI going on in the department and in the AI Institute. And that's also a very happening area. Uh, you know, there will be some bias towards um, uh, AI centric issue. At the end of the day, we only have 15 or 16 classes. So there is not a lot of uh, time to go through many things. So obviously these are going to be um, some selections that I end up making. Uh, some of the early classes are ones that I will conduct and uh, um, make you think about various things that are happening in uh, uh, computer science and AI. Um, you'll also notice that there is also bias towards interdisciplinary work or what is also called as translational research. research that makes real world impact. And now this will happen whether you stay in academia or go to industry or have your own startup. So very often you'll see that um, when you uh, listen at least to the lectures that I give or I conduct, you'll see a lot of discussion of applications or, or uh, in real world impact. Uh, with that, uh, let me get started with um, the, uh, the other thing is that Ideally, I would like to have, this is, I don't want to use this class as just giving you a lecture. I want to use the class for debate discussion. So this is um, somewhat of a flipped classroom and hence um, you're supposed to be doing reader, reading and whatever assignments, uh, assignment is not like you're answering your question, assignments is going through a paper or going through uh, an article. Uh, going through, uh, you know, something popular or something uh, detailed uh, and uh, come ready with some understanding of that issue and uh, potentially ask questions, I mean, or interact, right? So that's, that's a great way to show that you are learning new things that uh, you're thinking. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to jump into the uh, first, uh, you know, the, 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 the I'd ask you to see the video and read the an article. Uh, I just realized that that video was not ideal compared to many other videos because it showed the speaker, but it did not show the slide. I have separately posted the slide, so if you listen to the video, maybe you can make the connection, but otherwise it would be a little bit hard. I will uh, discuss some salient points today. All right. So um, this, this, this lecture was given be, before my move to South Carolina. Um, and that's why you see Ohio Center of Excellence in Compute, you know, Knowledge and Computing. And uh, there were, the number of places I gave the same talk uh, or related talks that mentioned at the bottom. The title is Computing for Human Experience, Semantics Empowered Sensor Services and Social Computing 
on ubiquitous web. Uh, one thing to also remember or keep in mind is that this talk was given in 2008-2010. We're going to mix uh, a bunch of uh, historic but important things, uh, especially by others, and um, uh, some of the recent things. This is somewhere in the middle. Uh, but the thing, themes or talks I will talk about, you know, I, I'll um, discuss uh, are um, uh, still very relevant. That's why I, I also uh, thought we should discuss this. A um, couple of my former students are uh, shown there. Uh, Mina, he, after graduation, she, she did probably the first dissertation in the world in the area of social media analytics. Uh, and uh, she joined IBM Research. She was a superstar there. And then she joined Facebook. And she's just moving um, to Seattle to work with um, uh, Yan Lukun, uh, one of the three Turing Award winner. You know, with he, so her team and Lukun's team will be uh, probably co collaborating. Uh, now, uh, the second guy is, uh, the other person is Corey Hansen. He is uh, very successful at um, uh, Bosch Research uh, and, and Technology. Um, in fact, uh, some of my other young uh, junior students then have done internship with him. One of them then got hired and joined with him. Another did internship uh, just last summer. Uh, they're working on autonomous vehicle and a semantics issue. Now, um, one of the term involved here is semantics. And um, around the, uh, the term semantics is pretty old, but around the turn of the century, uh, the term semantic web was coined. So, um, uh, and one of the, well, the, the, and while the term semantic web is not as popular as once it, once we thought it would be, uh, it's uh, pretty much everywhere. So there is a uh, related term that is very widely used now. The term is knowledge graph. And um, uh, the, the genesis of that term knowledge graph is in this semantic web. Um, knowledge graph today is used uh, everywhere. The most probably prominent example is the use of uh, knowledge graph by Google. So the third bullet says that Google buy, buy, Google bought MetaWeb, a small company that had um, a graph of 5 million entities. Well, that was all manually built. Eventually, with that as a core, Google built this Google knowledge graph. And in 2013, came up with a company called, uh, sorry, a product called Semantic Search, Google Semantic Search. Now it so happens that I had built, uh, I, had, I had started a company, my second company that I had started in 1999, we got a patent in 2001. Uh, so about 12, 13 years before Google uh, Knowledge Graph, that had used Knowledge Graph um, uh, for semantic search already. And we'll, uh, in, in probably next, uh, uh, you know, lecture, we will probably cover that. Now, um, uh, Okay, um, and so yeah, that is the, the patent is you know mentioned there. Um, uh, I'm going to go through some of the things in um, uh, you know rapidly because we just don't have that much time. So I'm I'm computing for human experiencing human experience. I'm introduce that to you using this one example, and you can see this is. Um, a very old iPhone, uh, an application is called Farm Helper, and uh, farmer takes a photograph uh, in his field and uh, tags blight and corn. See what happens. The Farm, farm Helper application picks up the um, metadata of uh, location and time, and uh, you know it uses geocoder services for that. And then looks up uh, the weather in that location, that area. So the satellites uh, uh, and uh, weather stations are continuously uh, going over the world and collecting the data. Uh, there may be even locally generated weather data. And uh, you get that data. Uh, the figure that is shown on the, 
on the top. Uh, it shows that the data stream that is coming from satellite or other resources or tower is annotated. Uh, there is a international standard called semantic sensor networking, which um, I started the work on that uh, at the World Wide Web Consortium, which makes the international internet standards or web standards. And Corey Hansen, who I uh, showed you earlier, was the key uh, was my student then. And he was a key designer of this standard. Uh, and then uh, you, with the weather data, um, uh, you look up the agricultural databases and soil survey and find out a lot of other information that are important related to farming. And with all that knowledge, uh, and people, um, you know, uh, if necessary, reaching out to the people. For example, with all this information, I could send the information, I could compute something automatically if I know how to, or I can send some of this thing to a uh, expert uh, online and say, look at all this information, tell me uh, what's the problem the farmer is facing and how we can resolve this problem, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, you're, we are all connected uh, at that, you know, now this, I should say 7 billion plus um, and that, uh, would ultimately help uh, people solve their problem. Uh, so the farmer doesn't have to be technology very savvy, uh, but you know, a lot of things can be done by the technology, uh, by, you know, mobile technology, sensor technology, other humans in the loop uh, that makes this, uh, improves the human experience. Here, farmer getting a better crop. Um, and the technology is getting the, the theme is that the technology is getting seamlessly integrated with the life. Seamless integration. That's a, there's an emphasis on seamless, a seamless integration. So uh, this idea is from uh, devices to ambient intelligence. A, and and, and um, the author says the most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves in the fabric of everyday life. Not something you have to bother. Oh, I have to use the technology. How to figure out? Um, Another one is machines that fit the human environment instead of forcing humans to enter there. So, uh, you know, a well-known scientist called Mark Weiser uh, came up with this Ubicom vision and wrote a, an influential article called The Computer of the 21st Century. And this was written, uh, to, you know, in the last decade of the 20th century. So, and it has been an influential article. And then, uh, you know, uh, another thing is technology that will allow us to combine what we can do on the internet with what we do in the physical world. So cyber physical world related things. So the definition I have for computer experience is that will employ a state of technology to non-destructively and unobtrusively complement the and enrich uh, normal human activities with minimal explicit concern or effort on the human's part. Right? And then I, I talk about um, this important characteristic, seamless, anticipatory, um, and ubiquitous, and encompasses, uh, encompassing, uh, and with a lot of other you know, technologies. So these are all the techniques that they work together and lead to a better human life. Um, now, in the article, I've uh, you know, given link to several other interesting things. The one that I explicitly pointed out is, as we may think, uh, uh, there are all these, uh, these articles that are worth reading. If you, uh, for example, say you want to work with me, uh, then I would say, well, these are some of the interesting things to learn about before we, you know, get in, you can get involved with the real research. And it's very, very important to understand broad vision before you get, um, you know, engrossed in the nitty gritty of a singular technology. Um, but anyway, there are a lot of things uh, interesting, but these are two very really interesting. And then there is uh, exponential computing uh, from, from Ramesh Jain and many others, intelligence that interface. Um, and um, uh, uh, the computing for human experience uh, that I define in some way borrows uh, from many of these things. Um, and some historical note, uh, when the web started, it started with the web pages. And uh, you would normally, you know, we'll go from one page to another way to another page. Initially, it was all browsing, no, no search, right? And then um, uh, there was a company called Yahoo. It's still there today. 
that was the largest company on internet it had built a directory then came a uh, web of databases where uh, pages were not just html coded but dynamically created the, uh, and 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 from that uh, rendered thus you know old technology now then web of resources so all kind of services and mashups and you can get data from multiple sources and bring them together on the browser on the front end then came a web of people they are connected to each other uh, and there are sensors uh, there are you know tens of billions of sensors out there now right and every uh, mobile phone has multiple sensors right accelerometer camera and many things and now um, you know and then we said well what what will happen is that you'll have this technology that will be a partner of the human and assistant for the thing now um uh, this assistant uh, it, you know when i wrote this slide the assistant was pretty early uh, nowadays we have chatbots and assistants so there's thankfully some of the things that we talked about in those days have become pretty much uh, a, a regular uh, technology now so you can ask the web um and you get the results uh, from uh, text data services and so, so and such now interestingly uh, take an example of a chatbot, Alexa or Google Assistant. Most of the time, even today, you can't exactly uh, 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 do the kind of things like spam helper. Uh, you can do a very transactional service like what is the weather today. You can do, uh, you can reserve a, a restaurant, uh, you know, uh, place. You can uh, uh, find out if flight is on time or not. But in the application I portrayed, there were a lot of different things, and one thing was driving another location to weather to uh, local environment and soil and all kinds of stuff come a plant knowledge base uh, uh, disease knowledge base all those things are to come together to answer that question that is still not happening a lot today uh, and uh, you know and the, there's another interesting thing that is happening is that um, in a computational context um, uh, in the web we really started with the first keywords it was text and some 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 images and some uh, low quality video then came patterns then came understanding of objects and then comes and that's not still quite achieved situations and events as a whole today if you think about what happened on uh, january 6 um there are a lot of things that happen and it's still very hard for the computer to put together the entire situation and, and narrate back to you it still takes a lot of human editors to bring together all lot of different sources of data and analysis to tell you what is happening. So, uh, in the uh, you know what we are looking for in the future is more enhanced experience than what we have even today on on Washington Post or New York Times or Fox News wherever you go, and um, and 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 uh, tech assimilated in the life. Okay, so that is what this uh, vision was about. Uh, there are a lot of things that enable these issues. Uh, I'm going to pass that. Uh, there are a lot of interesting technologies that uh, have been coming. Uh, uh, a lot more has come, but uh, uh, what used to be this uh, so-called uh, mind control headset, uh, the uh, brain uh, human in brain interface uh, is uh, now quite a bit of reality. So these things uh, uh, and body area and a lot, lot of other things, variable sensors. And then uh, the other interesting thing is that um, this sensor everywhere, um, you know, so uh, in 2009, there were 1.1 billion PCs, 4 billion mobile devices and 40 plus billion mobile sensors and 6 billion intelligent sensors meaning humans who are observing and they are texting, they are sending the photograph, they are capturing video, right? That creates a very powerful source of data and information. And um, uh, a whole bunch of uh, activities going on there. I will talk about it. The other thing that is very important, and I pointed out today, and even my today's info, uh, you know, PS student notice that I still continue to emphasize this a lot is the notion of abstraction. That computers are very, uh, very good at processing very large amount of data at a low level of fluidity. They go through millions of images. They can process uh, hours of uh, speech or of course billions of web pages but when you think about something at a 
much higher level uh, uh, and how for example human will talk to each other how you will, human will find happiness satisfaction um, you know or, or, or you even just think about let's say medical con context where a doctor tells you I feel that this is this I, I, this is my diagnosis and this is uh, the plan to manage your um, health there's a big difference between one lab and doctor's observation and your answers to doctor's questions to coming up with this um, you know solution and humans are not interested in all the little bits of data and all that they're interested in all the abstraction about how do i make my health better okay now this is an interesting um, uh, slide an important slide so a human centric aspect is what uh, we uh, we observe our senses are there uh, we communicate i'm speaking language we have language and we have perception that leads to cognition right but look what is happening there is a counterpart to that in the uh, technological world so you have um, uh, clearly communication your cell phone and others you have a lot of observations with all the sensors that i mentioned and your perception for example you have cameras and object detection systems that can identify an object they can you know and when object is uh, let's say not grabbed correctly by a robot arm it will it will help you correct the issue or when um, you know a lidar uh, finds an object in automated vehicle it will also uh, you know make it uh, you know have a perception in enhanced experience they are merging in a very seamless manner so human and machines are working together and very seamlessly and um, and the humans are taking initiative and all of you are doing that but machines can also take initiative and they can do a lot more so uh, you can uh, combine perception both by human and machine you can combine use semantics to improve uh, shared spaces and events and communicate about it and you can uh, you know uh, you know manage the uh, sensor information at a very large uh, scale uh, this is the work uh, that we did Corey was working with me on this uh, we had uh, you know coined the term called semantic sensor web uh, so there you have ontologies and knowledge graphs and you annotated the sensor data with that knowledge graph so that the data coming from sensor is meaningful uh, for machines and humans now I'll, i'm not going to go to some of the technical details uh, there are demos uh, i don't know whether they're active or not uh, i'm going to bypass uh, some of these other very interesting things um, this this, this um, um, interesting piece of work we did uh, called um, a semantic perception. So that work was about um, you know uh, our, our our brain uh, has very good perceptual power, uh, but how do we have perception uh, you know perceptual capability for machines? And and it talks about a uh, an automated system that um, uh, you know uh, converts. Uh, low-level observations um, into um, uh, let's see uh, so you have you know low-level observations and uh, ultimately it converts into perceptual theory so the you have observation from satellite and weather data and what you can see outside of your house and and the person you know you want to know oh um, uh, you know is that a flurry is that a rain shower is a rainstorm is it clear uh, not, probably most of you are not aware of blizzard but i have lived in minnesota and uh, you know uh, we used to have blizzard there um, okay This is not moving now. Let's see. Huh. Okay. So uh, you know you can. Um, um, I, I will, again I will not be to save us time. Uh, the reasoning process that goes through 
to convert from many sensory observations and knowledge into uh, these perceptions and per, in, uh, understanding. That's a perceptual cycle that we just defined. Uh, and uh, again, we are, um, so this is that cycle where you have this perception cycle that, um, you know, continuously, uh, uh, where is that annotated? It looks like I have to clear. Okay, um, so uh, there's a lot of things happening in the world. What does it mean to me? Uh, you know, and uh, here is a, a, an example where uh, we are talking about what happened in Mumbai, India on um, November 26, 2008. Um, there was, a, you know, terrorists st struck Mumbai. Uh, it, this thing start, lasted for uh, three days. Uh, uh, our January 6th insurrection lasted for only one day, or in only part of one day. This thing lasted for three days at nine different locations. So this is a guy, uh, a Cornell student visiting Mumbai. He, he uploaded all these images. And uh, uh, now remember, this is 2008, okay? So Twitter was started in 2008. Facebook was started in 2005. So this was one of the earliest... Uh, major event uh, uh, covered by Twitter. So world saw through the eyes of people, the world read it uh, through the uh, words of the people, the journalists and others or anybody writing, you know, tweet uh, and people told their stories to people, a powerful new in information dissemination had taken firm ground uh, and making possible for us to create a global network of citizens. And what I call, uh, this is a term I coined citizen censors. Uh, citizens observing, processing, transmitting, reporting. And then uh, we're talking about here social perceptions. Uh, in this shows you how healthcare debate uh, reform was discussed online uh, and what you can find out, uh, people talking about various issues. Um, I'm not going to go through this detail. Well, the people were talking about soil and green, uh, a concept that came from um, uh, garment factory in New York and how people were abused there. Uh, so here there was some uh, uh, people were using the analogy and for machines to understand this analogy is very challenging. And those are some of the detailed points that I was making there. I won't go, again go to discuss. Now think about this particular uh, in a set of tweets and uh, uh, we could under, understand that this tweet originated near these uh, uh, coordinates. So we say, what are other um, uh, uh, tweets coming from near uh, and 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 uh, uh, not just tweets but um, uh, other uh, data uh, like uh, images coming from that particular location. So and, and between that time, right? So uh, these are all uh, you know. So you can know that they are about the same Taj, uh, Overai, and Nadiman, uh, you know. And then so we can say tweets originated from an address near these things during the time interval between that. And from that, we can analyze that and we can understand what's happening at a particular location. Then there's a demo of tweets, these two trees. The interesting thing is this is now a commercial product in a company called Cognovi Labs, which I founded in 2016. Uh, the um, three of my former students are working there now uh, at, at senior technological technical uh, um, positions. Um, so, uh, I have a few things I'm going to now bypass. Here is an analysis of, um, uh, you know, a particular, uh, the, the Arab Spring events and the use of knowledge base or knowledge graph in that context. Um, and here it shows that how I can take these images, their location, structured metadata, geocoding, uh, addresses to location database. Uh, at that location, there are multiple uh, buildings, there is a Nariman house there. Is this guy is using word only Nariman, but I am inferring that that Nariman is Nariman house uh, uh, and, and, um, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, you get a lot of um, 
data and the knowledge and reasoning come together to understand that situation and make the things meaningful to human at a high level of abstraction. Uh, and so there's an image from satellite, uh, which uh, from a, somebody says there is an explosion, uh, there are tweets, and uh, they all come together to create a collage uh, of real-time understanding of what's happening in the world. And doing that on the, in real time and so on and so forth. So I'm going to be bypass a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, how did we build knowledge graphs and all kinds of stuff. But I'll just talk about this one uh, slide now, see, put together. So we have, you know, we, we deal with all kinds of data, structured and semi-structured data, text, uh, multimedia content, sensor data. It's very hard to understand them uh, because the computational processing for video, text, images are all very different. If you use a, a knowledge graph for ontology or domain model, it becomes in, more easy to uh, talk about the same object at a high level of abstraction rather than how they are depicted in each of the data uh, formats. And from that, we apply and develop a whole bunch of applications for search, integration, analysis, discovery, question answering, situation awareness. And then I have um, uh, an example, uh, and, and, and this detailed example that goes through how uh, we are, uh, you know, that farm help can be built or is built. Uh, these are some of my students at that time. Um, this, looking at this makes me tremendously proud, proud uh, just uh, for the sake of history. So I talked to you about Meena. Ajit Ramanabha, who is a key guy in Amazon Web Service. Uh, Pawan is at IBM Research uh, uh, Watson. Uh, he is the head of uh, data science and uh, NLP at uh, at um, Epzen. Uh, Epzen's co-founder uh, with, uh, with the valuation of half a billion dollar is another of my past PhD students who graduated before this group, uh, Kunal Verma. Uh, he is a tenure professor at Case Western Research University. Uh, this uh, is at Apple. Uh, he's, uh, I talked about Corey. He is at Apple uh, in high position. Uh, he's a Samsung research. He's a GA professor at GMU, and so on and so forth. He has his own company. Anyway, so uh, and there are a lot of other readings and all that. So I'm going to stop the sharing and I'm going to open up for discussion uh, now uh, about the what I present, and then I'm going to switch to a uh, little bit more on the uh, whenever Bush and as you may think. So um, uh, I would like to know uh, if um, you were all able to read um, uh, the, art, the main article uh, about uh, computer for human experience. Uh, why, let's see. Why don't you use the button uh, raise hand? Can you do that? If you have read the, the article, raise your hand. So I'll get some sense. Okay. For those of you that don't know where the uh, raise hand button is, if you click on reactions, there's a thing that pops out that shows you raise hand. Okay, um, so, so far roughly uh, uh, a little more than half or just about half have done that. I still don't, I still don't see it. It's, I have reactions, but I don't have raise hand. Uh, if you click on uh, reactions, you'll get a whole bunch of um, options of uh, clap and raise hand and uh, thumbs up. I can do a thumbs up and then a raise hand. And... Yeah. Well, below thumbs up is the raise hand it, symbol. So raise hand is first and then to open, uh, participants. Any, any symbol is okay. If you open up participants on the bottom right, there's raise hand. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's also. All right, wonderful. 
So looks like I'm 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 delighted that um, majority has done it. Only a few have not been able to do that. Uh, some of them may have registered late and such, but uh, let's hope that uh, next time almost everybody would uh, raise the hand. Okay, so okay, uh, uh, questions, guys, or comments, or points of discussion. How about um, what are your thoughts on? So it was about making uh, technology or integrating technology with um, um, with I guess just reality in, in general. What do you what are your thoughts on Google Glass, and do you think it'll make a comeback in that sector? The Google Glass, which came and went away, um, it will it will make um, uh, it will come back. But um, if you think about it, what you really have to do is um, the glass has to understand what human wants. And um, it has to come very close to understanding the human's need at that particular point of time. Uh, just kind of clicking here and saying, I want. Uh, to do something here and they have menu items that's too onerous for for most humans so to some extent your question is uh, very appropriate because um, here the technology is not really able to understand so the concept one concept that we pass through is called ambient intelligence the sensors everywhere you know what the human is doing what they want to do you predict what they might want to do those technologies have not fully matured, but you know they're maturing, and uh, so is, for example, um, you know, with the brain uh, human interfaces, uh, you know, uh, interfaces with brain, you're able to even uh, understand the language evolved in the human brain, as an example. You're able to understand certainly the emotions and many, many other things. So as they mature, and this. Um, you know, take an analogy of um, uh, Alexa or Assistant. When it first came out, their speech they are trained on was, uh, you know, uh, most users in US, uh, American Anglo-Saxons, or, uh, you know, white Americans, or just Americans in general. Uh, they could not, uh, for example, um, understand um, somebody from India and, English in India, or 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 China, you know, Chinese speaking English in China, because of you know uh, um, uh, diversity in in the pronunciations and other things and language usage. Then they gathered more and more data, more and more sample, trained on more and more of those things. And now, if I use uh, Google Assistant here, it uh, understands me very reasonably well. Still there are errors, but pretty good, it's usable now. Dictation is a lot more usable than they used to be before. So when this technology is going to more understand the human, then it's going to uh, uh, you know, uh, succeed more. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of things involved uh, in, in, in that because we have multiple senses. And uh, we not only do what we, you know, you can start going somewhere and you can predict that you go there, but actually you may change uh, you know, your path because you have some other thing going on, you see something and you start ch change your path. So there are a lot of challenges in understanding what humans want and do. Okay, any other question? Um, yes, Dr. Chef. Um, I uh, know that you mentioned um, that, that computers are able to process um, low level data very easily, but with higher level data and making abstractions, it's more difficult. Um, why is that? Why is it more difficult for computers to interpret and process that high level data, that, that data that's actually in, informative to us as humans? Um, and what needs to change in order for computers to be better at making these abstractions? Ah, this is an excellent question. Um, Part of it is to do with evolution, that people understanding um, 
you know, the, just the progress of computation. And um, this area is pretty close to our work and, and what we do now. And I'll give you just a glimpse of that. So um, there was a first generation of AI in 1980s until uh, I think about 1990. Uh, and uh, that with the, there was a huge euphoria about AI then also. And uh, companies like, you know, countries like Japan invested in something called fifth generation in logic based framework. And, uh, and, and the, with the logic based reasoning and such, sim in, which we today call symbolic AI. That did not succeed too well in meeting its um, objective. The best thing that happened in those, uh, in that time, was to build um, uh, expert systems and planning systems. So humans will en explicitly encode knowledge in the form of rules, and uh, they would then um, uh, uh, process it for some decision-making application. There was a, a very well-known uh, expert system built for uh, kind of diagnosis. Uh, of 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 disease. Um, uh, I remember in 1988, I worked on a project uh, to build a um, uh, an expert system for chromium plating of uh, military uh, aircraft landing gears. So aircrafts have landing gears, and uh, all those gears are plated with chromium. When chromium plating is, you know, this chemical process where you take the metal and the uh, liquid has to be a certain temperature with certain composition and then you make sure that you put the liquid and uh, make sure that evenly coated and all that kind of stuff. Any one little thing, uh, a very finicky process, the whole thing has to be thrown away. Uh, it will have a little bubble. Uh, then, well, that bubble will burst and uh, it will start, uh, the metal will start corroding from there. So I build that kind of stuff. Uh, also, uh, and there are also planning systems that were built, uh, for example, something called manufacturing and resource planning. So, um, uh, in the factory floor, very little schedule production of what part. Those things work, but beyond that, there wasn't much success. The other thing is the computers were, you know, not powerful also in those days, but very largely explicitly building the knowledge was very cumbersome. Area of something area called knowledge engineering, and um, and uh, essentially it died because it could only solve niche uh, thing. Now think about what happened in um, uh, the second generation of AI, which is where we are. That also has two phases. The first phase was uh, the first century, around 2005 to 2010. This is where uh, supervised machine learning. And you know the, the early models. Um, uh, you you talk about uh, hidden Markov model, Bayesian classification, uh, uh, you know CRF, com you know conditional random fields. These kind of techniques were developed random forests and such. And uh, there were tools, and you program them. And there, uh, it started to show progress because you the problem definition was relatively simple, uh, a taxonomy. And you want to map the text to the taxonomy. And they work reasonably well for some of the problems. Then came 2012, where an old concept of um, neural network, uh, uh, you know, somebody developed algor uh, you know, uh, algorithms that were a lot better performing and the appropriate computational power to do that uh, was now available. So you started seeing so-called neural network or deep learning, where you have multiple layers and, and such. Now comes to this important question that you ask. Um, that um, why do you need abstraction? What are the problems in machines supporting the abstraction? So let us take the example of um, natural language processing. And um, uh, Today, we have developed tremendously powerful uh, language models 
uh, BERT, GPT-2, GPT-3, and just this week, um, GPT-3 has 175 million parameters. And GP just heard uh, this last week that uh, Google has developed another one with 1 billion parameters. And there are some things that they do very well. They process the text, but they don't understand it. And some very simple problems uh, that you, you know, uh, questions you can ask them and they totally fail. Why? Because this language model have been um, uh, created from the data that um, uh, uh, from which generation of abstractions and uh, the, the the understanding it you know in, in involved in language understanding uh, is, is, is they're far off so to understand language you have to understand anaphora you have to understand um, uh, you know synonyms you have to understand um, sarcasm uh, you have to understand emotion you have to understand um, uh, whether you know the person uh, i'll give you one example um, we we have i had a million dollar project on harassment detection on social media and uh, uh, a couple of my students did a wonderful work uh, we had articles in time magazine and uh, bbc and many other places on cursing on social media so they looked at cursing now some people did the work uh, to kind of equate cursing with um, harassment saying if somebody's using foul language it is harassing you well actually it so turns out that um, teenagers use uh, among friends extensively use foul language but that is if, if a girl tells another girl bitch she does not mean bad at all right uh, so um, and cool is good and uh, you know hot is so there are all these urban dictionary kind of stuff. Um, that uh, uh, kind of uh, aspect is not what is in the data, and it's not uh, you're not trained the uh, deep learning or neural network algorithms to understand all of these things, right? So to get the abstraction, you'll have to train and bring into the um, uh, uh, Statistical AI, which is what this uh, deep learning, you know, is uh, into, uh, you know, you have to bring the knowledge of human um, uh, of, of the real world, not the digital world into this process. So we do that by what we, we have used uh, and coined the term, I coined the term called knowledge infused learning. So one of our, probably our third class will be on this general topic, uh, early part of this topic, where we are going to, uh, where we say, here's the knowledge of various things, a knowledge about uh, human emotions, knowledge about um, uh, uh, linguistic, uh, language syntax, uh, and then uh, domain knowledge. So we, one of our projects is about COVID-19 and how, during COVID-19, how people uh, talk about mental health and addiction. Now to understand mental health and addiction, you need to understand what people, what is mental health issue and what is addiction. And so in our case, we uh, extracted from something called DSM-5. DSM-5 is the manual that mental health experts use uh, to learn themselves the area of mental health. That is what people as a clinician training, that is what clinician, clinical training is about. We learn from that and then we merge it with deep learning. That now is giving us ability to bring in the abstraction. So the only learning from the data is failing to give you the abstraction. Uh, it does something, but there is a lot of work. So if you think about CNN and use for image processing, then uh, you know up approximately at a lower level you process the pixel start understanding the uh, contour and uh, start understanding the um, shapes and then start naming the objects that you can recognize right so uh, you can say there is a cat in this picture uh, but there is a lot of actual um, human uh, interpretation that's going on and a lot of uh, computer only understands similarity or pattern 
it actually has no real understanding of cat as a word. If it is, if it tells it is cat, is because it has seen the text where the word cat is associated with that image. And if there is no such example available or not enough example available, it will fail to tell you the type of cat it is. So basically bringing together uh, this uh, area, emerging area called hybrid AR or neuro uh, symbolic computing. Uh, 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 and, and that's really where knowledge is playing a big role. Semantics is playing a big role. And that is where uh, I think we are um, able to, okay. Um, I want to spend just a uh, bit of point, very short time to uh, talk about as we think. And I, I'm going to ask um, um, Kaushik to just present a top level idea. He had agreed to read the paper and he says, I will give you, uh, you know, you'll present the general idea to set the course. Kaushik, are you? Oh, okay. I don't see Kaushik, so something went wrong there. Uh, maybe he saw the 315 uh, error. Okay, oh, I'll describe that. So I want to tell you about, I, I, I want to tell you why this is a, a seminal paper. Why? First of all, it was written in 1945. But um, it was the first conceptualization of uh, how could you conceive of a computer that is like brain so he introduced this concept of memex and then i will talk to, tell you about one very interesting thing uh, that they had um, well um Cellini, what is the one of these interesting thing that uh, uh, i you know that that he talks about other than memex fundamental uh, uh, one thing that i found interesting was that he talks about how we create knowledge fast, but uh, that we might need a way to go through it, like examine it at some point. I think it that that vision might be the one that we have with the internet that everything is connected and we can go through it. So mm. that is one thing that I picked up. So his, he, at this his time, uh, the transistors were not even there uh, when he was writing that article. So he actually, he saw something even without the technology that would support it. He did not see mm. the technology, but he could see something beyond that and could see that there would be this uh, uh, requirement. So he there kind is of- one, There yeah. is one very powerful computational concept he discussed. What is that? Vishal, Vedant, um, Burn. Is it the memory, like uh, keeping memory outside of, like you don't have to memorize things, you can keep it outside? No, that's something else I'm interested in. That should, that should step out. He, he, he describes how he thinks brain works using one very interesting concept. Uh, the concept, I think he's termed it trailblazing. So he says the human brain latches onto the concept and then traverses to the other, to other concept in context. A very powerful, uh, I think, view that, that influenced me a lot. And I did a bunch of work in uh, um, a relationship, uh, relationship web. So essentially uh, in the web, you have web pages and hypertext links and all that kind of stuff. But how can I essentially, assuming this empirical model, assuming that uh, he's right, that this is how brain works, what is the equivalent, how, how can I adapt that in consuming the data on the web or any, any other place? So uh, that allowed me to focus, um, uh, put the attention on relationships, not entities. Right? So the concept called, um, uh, you know, Let's say uh, if there is a there is a node in the graph with my name Amit Shet. That node and by uh, you know and that label is practically meaningless until you start to start to look at explore all the relationship 
uh, with that, saying, oh, this person is a computer scientist, he's a father, he's a director of AI Institute, he, uh, but whatever those things are, he teaches this course. That is all, this, these are all the relationships that give the meaning to this concept or, you know, call uh, Amit Shep. Without that, the concept is, has no value or very little value, none, almost none. That is a very fundamental point that how we, we understand things by association, by relationship, right? And, and, hence, uh, and, and hence, that also gave one very fundamental uh, insight to me uh, to understand when a uh, statistical learning algorithm works or not. To me, one of the main reasons for failure of statistical algorithm is that they can understand the patterns, but they don't understand the, uh, uh, the, 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 the meaning of that pattern. Uh, you have to name the relationship. You can't just, just saying that uh, uh, employee is connected to a, um, a company is uh, not mean, meaningful enough. Um, employee owns stock in the company, employee works for the company as a full-time employee, employee works as a contractor for the company. These are three different relationships. And just the connection, so is finding the connection that these things are connected frequently, they have uh, occur together the, in the vector space, they are co-located. That is very limited, right? So that's the fundamental thing that um, we are going to, uh, that, that we need to understand. All right, I hope, um, uh, I think the time is, no, this is until 3.30, right? Okay, so we have still uh, five, uh, uh, 10 minutes. So what, what else, uh, does anybody want to talk about anything else that they have read, either as you may think or anything else? Uh, professor, I, I've got a comment actually. Yeah. Um, I, read, I read your essay um, on the computing for human experience and uh -huh. I was, I was curious, um, you talk about, you talked earlier about how we recognize, um, you know, we see a cat as a cat, but the uh, computer would have to interpret what a cat is and would have to recognize the pattern. Um, it doesn't just have the initial knowledge of what a cat is. So I think that uh, having or teaching computers uh, or, teaching them to adapt to the human experience, I feel like that would raise some privacy concerns uh, with uh, sensor, the sensors. Uh, what exactly uh, is okay to observe and uh, date and what would you, how would you stop it from um, observing things that um, it's not meant to? Oh, this is, that's, a, that's an area uh, of very active discussion today uh, in computer science. So uh, there is an area called oversight and uh, particularly um, uh, there are issues of something, you know, ethics and trust and uh, many other things. Uh, it's a very big topic and a um, lot of issues here are not just computational or technical issues, they're societal issues. Um, you know, I know people um, in my family circle who would not trust Facebook and they don't, they stop using Facebook. And I know uh, others who use Facebook, even though they know uh, Facebook collects so much data. One time you use Facebook, uh, uh, you click on one advertisement, check, and you see that Facebook uh, brings out related advertisement until sometime as, you know, you, you, until you stop talking about the uh, that topic it has actually a knowledge it, it has a it's called facebook open graph and they have their own uh, taxonomy and uh, a graph of uh, representation and if you they will they will look for associations in those particular semantic areas so uh, whether something should be observed or not um, um, is many dimensions it is a dimension whether something is ethically ethically wrong uh, for example, uh, you know, if a government uh, is uh, really doing uh, video profiling of every citizen uh, in a particular region of a country, uh, some will consider to be uh, ethically wrong. 
but uh, many in that particular country, and you probably know what I'm talking about, will consider it to be okay. So first of all, that is one thing. Second thing is uh, an individual right. So, you know, I just made the comment in a societal context, but uh, in human rights context, but then it may be individual. So one person says, today I had to make a choice. Uh, you know, when I started using an application, uh, it says, well, uh, you have an option to, um, uh, uh, you know, allow us to use your location or not. If you allow us to use your uh, location, these are the advantages. If you don't allow, uh, then you can still use the application, but, you know, you'll get approximate information that comes up. So that is an issue, right? Um, there is a thing like, the other thing would be like uh, breaking the, uh, you know, uh, what's your glass. So for example, I have my personal information in my card that I'm carrying with me. Uh, I don't want anybody to read that unless I am in a dire, I'm in an emergency room, then you can look, look up all my health data and all my allergies, right? So there are that kind of issues. We worked on one privacy um, uh, matter where uh, we worked on healthcare data and healthcare data is considered to be uh, sensitive. And then we develop algorithms where we leave it for humans, uh, the patient, to decide whether they want to uh, uh, make that avail data available to somebody else uh, in a certain role uh, or not. And, uh, uh, you know, in the return of their making the data available, they're going to get service. So um, one of my, our talks we'll have is in the area of uh, personalized digital health. And uh, I, we work with, um, asthma patient and that to children. So the, it's, you can see very sensitive data. So here basically, uh, you know, you get them, uh, you, you discuss with them uh, or their parents or guardian, the, um, uh, you know, whether they are giving you the uh, uh, ability to uh, uh, look at the data uh, in uh, anonymous form and, um, so far as non-clinical person is concerned, and uh, identifiable form, there is a rule called HIPAA rule uh, for healthcare data. Uh, to um, uh, in case because they are clinicians, they are authorized in the real world. You're getting that your your you are their your patient, so they allow them to also uh, access your additional digital data with the sensors that we give them. So, uh, you know, there, there's a whole tier of things there and the, uh, the issue of giving the control to the data owner or generator. But there also, there are many interesting issues involved uh, because people want the technology to be very simple to use. And this additional thing about choosing this or that and that is too complex for many people. Not, you know, you are a honors college, uh, you know, smart student. Uh, there are so many people who are very far from any technology. So for them, it will be very hard to use. So there are other issues of that nature. So anyway, you asked a question that is very, very uh, deep and uh, very contextual and, it, you know, depends on the context, the type of data, the type of person, the, uh, what do you get in return and many, many considerations. Okay, thank you. Uh, Professor Shah, I have, I have a question actually. Um, mm -hmm. So reading through um, Bush's As We May Think uh, led me to think about because he, when he was writing it, his context was the end of World War II and um, the steps forward of science and technology at that time. And he was he had a vision for the future. So uh, my question is, you know, in this age, we are, um, there's more and more technology integrated into our lives every year, right? There's been wearable sensors. There are now in, non-invasive implanted sensors. Uh, when do you think, do you, do you think, well, you know, what is the next iteration of uh, CHE, um, given the fact that we're probably going to be suing, seeing like implanted computers, like personal computing devices, uh, probably in the next 20 years? Will there be any significant changes to this vision? Yeah, it would have. And, and, and in a way, it is similar to my answer for the Google Glass kind of thing, in that, um, it is very important that computer understands the human's context. Uh, in the whole idea of computer for human experience, 
is also a, a reaction to the notion that was prevalent in some circles or large circles in computing, where essentially um, uh, humans were required to uh, uh, fit what computers can do or the style of computer working. So, so while things are changing now, like with uh, brain interfaces, but by and large for vast uh, the amount of time since we have had computers, uh, it has been up to the human to convey to the computer using a keyboard. And then mouse came and that, but that is remain really still the, you know, predominant thing. Now with the mobile phone, you can uh, touch and swipe and that has changed. Um, I had used the word uh, intelligence interface coined by uh, Gruber, Tom Gruber. Tom Gruber was the guy who was the co-founder of Siri, which was acquired by uh, Apple. Okay. Uh, and by the way, CD was one of the earliest computer uh, uh, program with uh, which heavily relied on knowledge graphs or ontology. But uh, with your question about, uh, let's say, implanted devices, um, these devices, for example, can, uh, 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 one of the area of our interest is to uh, develop a chatbot uh, and, and mobile application that helps um, um, uh, uh, um, uh, type one diabetes children to choose and make decision about the food intake, whether they can or should eat a particular food or not. So we are doing some very exciting work on uh, on top, you know, uh, developing an application where you can speak to it. I'm having Kentucky Fried Chicken, or you can uh, text to it, but you can also take the photograph of what you are uh, eating. And then uh, we would uh, automatically segment the image, identify different, uh, you know, uh, 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 kind of uh, items on the plate, and then uh, I, I try to identify what that item is, and then look up what is the nutritional content of that thing, which will give you carbohydrates and other things which are important for diabetes, and then it will help you make um, uh, decisions uh, on whether you should eat or not, right? Uh, so, uh, so imagine that uh, tomorrow, uh, let me give you a, a on the fly example of the application like the farm helper today. So uh, the implants uh, that uh, measure your uh, glucose uh, are about there, are there already. Uh, uh, well, the, currently you already have a pretty good thing, patches and other things that can tell you uh, your, your sugar level uh, at that time. Uh, and then you can also, you know, you know have implants also uh, that would not require you to change these patches all that often and so on and so forth. Now, uh, and understand that, um, you know, uh, assume that you can train that to understand even craving, concept of the craving, let's say. Um, uh, you know, we can do studies to understand that if your uh, sugar goes too low, then you have craving of this kind, blah, blah, blah. Now, the person is going through the, uh, you know, uh, Place where you can see all is your glass looks at all the different um, uh, uh, items that you can take, and it in real time figures out whether at this time that particular uh, uh, item is compatible or not with your current uh, health condition, particularly uh, diabetes and sugar. Right, so um, uh, that that will be um, you know very very valuable, and this will be a very good example of computing for human experience where you have uh, the sophisticated interfaces and devices and um, uh, image processing and uh, knowledge base, deep learning and all kinds of things and medical knowledge, everything comes together in creating this application. But I've not even fully explored with you all the thing it would take to do that. Um, uh, we are taking baby step in, develop step in developing such applications right now. We have partners in medical area, and uh, I'm just I just talked about limited set of things that you need to do, and, and and think about the complexity for doing this, and think about so so this is the a lot more and one thing I point out is that any real world solution like this because you know this is very important managing diabetes is a very important thing uh, nearly half of the U.S. population adults are either diabetic or pre-diabetic. What a huge, uh, you know, number of people we are talking about really 
100 million plus people uh, that uh, can immediately benefit from this, right? But also recognize the complexity, number of things involved. I just pointed out several of them to make such things happen, right? So um, humans have for all this time uh, with the you know, patient and doctor uh, and you know, involved somehow figure out a way to manage their uh, uh, diabetes. And now a computational solution, maybe even more sophisticated, but extremely complex uh, and, and challenging. But that is, uh, you know, that, that is a promise of future competing for human experience. All right, uh, I think we. Uh, uh, yes. Yes. So, yes, uh, sir, I had a question. Sure. Uh, now, uh, since the official time for the class is done, if somebody wants to uh, leave, don't be shy, but we are most welcome to stay on and listen to the question and my answer. Go ahead. Oh, okay, sir, you, uh, you were saying about uh, NLP models that. Uh, uh, it really doesn't understand the data, but uh, it really, uh, really don't process the data, but it, underst uh, it doesn't understand it. It just processed it. Yeah, uh, it is. And why uh, uh, use of web semantics was to improve the, uh, improve the internet. Like uh, there are a bunch of web pages, but they are not closely linked. Like if I search for, for example, Michael Jackson, it shows bunch of pages, but it really doesn't understand it. For example, if I saw for uh, uh, one way to improve web is to, if I search for uh, Michael Jackson, then related pages to pop culture or where he was born, like uh, he was born on United States. So related pages can also pop up. So it can be linked together. But using NLP models, it can be done because it really doesn't understand the data. So how this vision can be achieved to link uh, web pages together can be achieved. And also yes. I want to ask other prominent examples of uh, knowledge graph. Oh, there are a huge number of examples of knowledge graph. Uh, so um, uh, you can send me a note. I will add you to our uh, uh, LinkedIn group on uh, knowledge graph. Uh, there's a lot of material on that. Um, uh, and knowledge graph ontologies are there for uh, marketing. They are there for uh, are, the Amazon uses it, Google uses it, Microsoft uses it, Facebook uses it, LinkedIn uses it, and um, and and many many other companies uses it. Uh, Samsung uses it, um, uh, the GM uses it, and so General Motors uses it, and so on and so forth. So it's a very widespread use, um, and uh, people are. You know, uh, just about figuring out how to um, combine, uh, you know, both the knowledge graphs and uh, learning techniques, the machine learning techniques. Um, so the application of these are just very large. In one of the uh, future uh, example, we'll, uh, you know, one of the classes we'll discuss this in more detail. Um, I had a comment uh, about something a student brought up earlier. I don't know if they're still here, but. Uh, he asked about why computers can't understand um, data or really abstract data and draw conclusions and observations from certain data. Um, so I'm taking neuromorphic computing alongside this class. And uh, what we've learned so far is uh, that the main reason is because our traditional view of computing is based on a kind of a system where it's you input output and then in between you process. Um, whereas the neuromorphic computing model is more so uh, much more observant and can uh, will hopefully be able to draw conclusions. Um, so I was wondering uh, if we'll be covering some neuromorphic computing topics in this like uh, class or if there will be any presentations on that uh, topic. Probably not. Uh, uh, I actually teach another course uh, occasionally, and you can go online to the AI Institute's uh, YouTube channel, a page where there is a, a playlist on semantic, cognitive, and perceptual computing. Uh, so, it, in, in that, um, uh, that is a seminar, uh, you know, three three credit seminar, where uh, we have uh, where we actually uh, take inspiration from behavioral economics, 
uh, neuroscience, uh, cognitive science, uh, and variety of different fields, and brain-inspired computing, and so on and so forth. So uh, we uh, it will take that kind of um, uh, uh, you know class to uh, start looking at uh, what you you have. It will be a bit too advanced. Um, uh, we some of my students are interested in this kind of issues and uh, in, in learning from neuro, um, sci, you know neuroscience. In fact, this is a hot topic. Uh, we have just announced a position to hire a faculty at the intersection of neuroscience and AI. Uh, so that will be jointly between um, uh, a center on neuroscience and uh, AI institute. Uh, but it, it'll, it, it's a very exciting topic. Uh, the, the, um, there was a, a very interesting panel uh, called AI, on AI debate on neuroscience and AI. And a lot of interesting discussions on this were happening. Uh, if you um, uh, contact me on uh, you know, LinkedIn messaging or some of the messaging, I will send you a link to that um, uh, you know, panel, more than uh, one and a half hour panel that, that had uh, some neuroscientists and computer scientists discussing some of these issues. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, mm -hmm. Doctor Shah, I have a question. Uh, so we discussed about planning, and now planning has its uh, has made its way back uh, into the limelight. So there are a lot of applications uh, of chatbots that are being uh, developed using planning. Uh, so we are uh, basically using planning to develop goal-oriented chatbots. So apart from achieving that, uh, or uh, let me rephrase it uh, by using planning and neural network uh, models that are out there. Uh, do you think we'll be able to achieve the best chatbots uh, till date, or uh, there will be still uh, drawbacks in the chatbots? And there is always uh, like what else would be the scope of improvement in a chatbot? Oh, it's uh, there will be certainly improvement, uh, and that is really consistent with, with uh, you know the vision that I've tried to pursue of uh, top-down and bottom-up computing. So planning is top-down and uh, deep learning is bottom-up, and that's uh, Corey's work on semantic perception was uh, on this topic. Uh, so uh, so there will be very good progress uh, in, uh, 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 because uh, people, uh, you know, uh, some of the more future uses of um, uh, chatbots uh, or virtual health assistants will be in the context of um, uh, uh, the, let's say, uh, need to manage a critical, a chronic disease for a patient. So with regards to that objective, you can always have planning uh, to help guide to achieve uh, a, that stated objective, desired objective, uh, rather than just being reactive. So you can be more proactive in building the agent and you know, the, you can, for example, decide the uh, uh, order in which you can ask, uh, ask 20 questions or, or uh, questions such that you have to ask fewest questions so the user is not fatigued. So there are many such uh, interesting issues why these two things should be merged. Uh, and uh, in, there is a proposal that we are currently working where uh, Biplov is also uh, you know, involved and so is, uh, that, that involves Biplov and uh, Sriram Natarajan uh, that, uh, you know, where I possibly such things may be involved. Uh, there are two current uh, virtual assistant proposal, uh, two pro pro proposals going on and you should possibly consider, uh, you know, participating at least as an observer with them. Talk to Kaushik about both the proposals and uh, then you can decide if anything you have bandwidth to join any one of them. Okay, guys, we'll take a leave now. I'll put up information probably tomorrow about uh, next class. Talk to you.